What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. Back at you guys with another episode, man. So tonight's episode is very special. You want to know why? Because it's championship weekend. We got Lions 49ers, Chiefs Ravens, Lamar Jackson versus Patrick Mahomes. Can Lamar Jackson break through? Can he get to the Super Bowl finally? I mean, he's accomplished nearly everything there is to achieve in the NFL at this point in his career other than winning a Super Bowl. If Lamar can knock off Patrick Mahomes, I think without a doubt he'll be the best quarterback in the National Football League. Then what about the 49ers and the Detroit Lions? Because the Detroit Lions, they're a touchdown underdog. But the 49ers, with how they played against Green Bay, I think they gave the Detroit Lions the blueprint for how to win. The Tennessee Titans hired a new head coach, Brian Callahan. I'm going to give my thoughts on him. We're also going to dive into the big staff moves that the Jaguars and Chicago Bears made. And finally, I got to say something about Ohio State. Before we begin, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Remember that we're not just a YouTube channel. We are a podcast, and you can find every episode of the JT Sports Podcast available in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from, you can find the podcast. Also, give us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. Share the pod with your friends, family members, and acquaintances if you enjoy and let's get into it man so nfc championship this is the second time in franchise history for the detroit lions that they've played in this game the last time the lions played in the nfc championship it was in the 90s and the 49ers are seven point favorite to start out this game right but you look at how they played last week against the green bay packers is it fair to say that green bay Gave Detroit the blueprint to win this game. The 49ers are one of those teams that they look very good on paper. On paper, you look at their roster and compare it to Detroit and you say the 49ers are a better team. But you look at how they perform. They don't play up to the level of talent that they have. Their defense doesn't have a consistent pass rush. Nick Bosa has had a down year. 49ers fans will tell you that. You have Chase Young, who I I haven't even heard this dude's name since he got traded to the team. I thought that Chase Young was going to have a big impact, but I, I haven't even I don't even know that he even starts. I didn't know Chase Young was starting until I saw the starting lineups in their game last week. They also don't really have a great run defense, so Detroit offensively. They can do everything. They can beat you throwing the football with Jared Goff. They have really good receivers. Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams. 49, the 49ers, their secondary is average. And if they don't have a good pass rush, which the Detroit Lions have a very good offensive line, the Lions are one of the few teams in the league this season that you can say had a lead offensive line. The 49ers, if they can't get pressure on Jared Goff, their secondary is going to get carved up by this passing attack. And like we saw last week against the Green Bay Packers, they didn't have the ability to get after Jordan Love. And even when they were able to get pressure on Jordan Love, he was making a lot of things happen outside the pocket. Detroit, defensively against the 49ers, I don't trust Detroit secondary. I really don't. And you can probably say the same thing about the 49ers with the Detroit Lions. But the Detroit Lions secondary did play pretty... Oh, I can't even say they played okay against the Buccaneers. I, I just don't really know if their secondary is going to be able to slow down the 49ers when they throw the football with Brock Purdy. I know a lot of people don't seem to be fans of Brock Purdy, but going up against the Lions secondary... They got a lot of mismatches. Debo Samuel, we don't know if he's going to play in this game, but even if he doesn't play in this game, Brendan Ayuk, George Kittle, they should eat. The Lions just don't have a great secondary. 
And Charlie Gardner-Johnson, I want to see what he's going to do against George Kittle because this dude talks a lot of shit. And I like him. He's kind of like the new version of Richard Sherman. And we need more players like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. I think players like him make the game fun. But, you know, how is he? Is he going to be able to back up all his trash talking against George Kittle? Because George Kittle, he's been going off as of late. And if they can't slow him down, they're going to have a hard time being able to get off the field. The run defense is really good. How are they going to do against Christian McCaffrey? Well, I guess we'll find out. But if they can slow down Christian McCaffrey, you know, and he has to be more of a factor in the passing game than he is the run game, then how are you going to be able to slow him down? Do you have a linebacker who you can put on Christian McCaffrey? So the 49ers, you like how they match up with their passing attack against the Detroit Lions secondary. Their offensive line is really good when it comes to protecting Brock Purdy. Trey, um, Aiden Hutchinson, he's been really good. He has been, without a doubt, one of the more underrated pass rushers in the league. And the only reason I say underrated is because I think he's kind of starting to become in that category where he's just a tad notch below the Michael Parsons and the TJ Watts of the world and the Miles Garrett. He's a A-minus pass rusher. He's not an A-plus pass rusher yet. The 49ers, we know they got Trent Williams, but is there other offensive tackle going to be able to hold up against Aiden Hutchinson? And not only do they have Aiden Hutchinson, but they also have a couple of other guys who can get after the quarterback. But Brock Purdy, though, with how... He is going to look in this game against the Lions secondary. He should play way better than he did against the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers had a top 10 pass defense. The Detroit Lions secondary is not that good. We saw Baker Mayfield throw three touchdowns on this on this secondary. Hell, they gave up a touchdown before halftime with only like a couple of seconds left to spare. So, I mean, you like the 49ers ability to throw the football. The question is, can you trust Brock Purdy to protect the football? We've seen plenty of games this season when the 49ers have lost, like, for example, when they lost to the Minnesota Vikings on Monday Night Football. Brock Purdy, he sold, he threw like two interceptions, and they were really costly, especially in the fourth quarter. And the Detroit Lions, although they don't have a great secondary, they do have the ability to generate turnovers, especially in big moments. Brock Purdy is going to have to show us that he is truly an elite quarterback. That's been the most polarizing discussion in the league this year. Is Brock Purdy elite? Is he a game manager? He came through for the 49ers last week, and he didn't have a great game, but it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish, and he finished off strong. He led them to the win. That's what you expect out of your franchise quarterback. And against a Detroit Lions secondary that – got absolutely destroyed by Baker Mayfield, you expect Brock Purdy to have a big bounce back game. But the Detroit Lions, though, I expect them to keep it close. I'm not expecting the Detroit Lions to get blown out by San Francisco. They got way too good of a team. They have a coaching advantage when it comes to Ben Johnson versus Steve Wilkes. Come on, man. Like, they wanted to fire Steve Wilkes at one point in the middle of the season. And this defense has played a lot better, but it's still not really that good. And I like Ben Johnson's ability to scheme guys open. Not only that, he's really innovative. And I'm expecting him to get the better of Steve Wilkes in that matchup, his offense against the 49ers defense. I'm still going to... I'm still going to start with San Fran to win, though. The reason why I have to go with San Francisco to win is because at the end of the day, I still do believe that they do have the slightly better team. The Lions do have the ability to keep this thing close, and I do believe that they have a chance to win also. But the 49ers, I, I just think that they're going to find a way to get this one out. I really can see this game going either way. Truthfully, the Detroit Lions, they can run the football. They got David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs. This is tough, man. I'm going with the 49ers, 24 
20 is going to be my final score prediction. We got the Kansas City Chiefs slide into Baltimore to take on the Marvelous and the Baltimore Ravens. Oh my goodness. It doesn't get no better than this, people. Lamar Jackson, who's about to win his second MVP award, going against Patrick Mahomes, who is in his sixth straight AFC championship. And listen, I came out a couple of weeks ago, and I told you guys that Lamar Jackson is the best quarterback in the NFL. Well, now this is going to be his opportunity to prove it. And let me tell you guys something, man. The Kansas City Chiefs, they should not be overlooked in this game like I had a friend of mine so I had to convince not to take the Baltimore Ravens to beat Kansas City by more than seven and a half let me I get that Kansas City looked really you know inconsistent during the majority of the regular season on offense but sometimes you'll have teams that when they get to the playoffs they're a better version of themselves than what they were in the regular season. You see, playoff football is a lot different from regular season football. And Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes have the ability to elevate when the stakes are the highest. And their offense has played their best games of the season the last two weeks against the Buffalo Bills and against the Miami Dolphins. And both of those two teams had pretty solid defenses. The Buffalo Bills, I say solid, not great because they've had injuries. But against the Baltimore Ravens, they know that they have a disadvantage when it comes to talent. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to have an opportunity to keep this thing close. They have Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, and Travis Kelsey playing at a high level. I thought Travis Kelsey was washed at this point, but he, he's turned it up a notch the last couple of weeks. So as long as you got Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey, you always got a chance. And Patrick Mahomes is like Tom Brady now, all right? He's not exactly like Tom Brady, Tom Brady, but he's damn near close to him. And you can never count out Patrick Mahomes. You know how people used to be like, man, I'm finna take the Patriots to win just because they got Brady. Well, you can kind of make that same argument for Patrick Mahomes. And with how he's been playing... He's been damn near unstoppable. He's been making no mistakes. He's been like a machine back there. He's just been completing every single pass that there is to make. And he's leading Kansas City up and down the field. And Kansas City's offensive line has played their best football too. But Baltimore, though, they play their best football when they're at home. We've seen them clobber the Lions at home. We saw them demolish the Seattle Seahawks. But one thing about Baltimore that concerns me in this game is their consistency on offense. This offense doesn't play as good as what they should. And the Kansas City Chiefs got a really good defense. Now, they do have an injury to one of their linebackers, Willie Gay. We don't know if he's going to be able to play in this game. I believe that he has a neck injury. So we don't really know about his status, but... Despite the injuries that Kansas City may have, they still have really good coaching. Steve Spagnuolo is one of the most respected defensive coordinators in the National Football League. You got Chris Jones. Legereus Sneed is locking everything up. Did you not see him jam Tyree Kill to the ground? Had that boy knees ashy, man. Like they, they got some ball players on Kansas City's defense. And I don't believe this is going to be a game that you know, Lamar Jackson is just going to get it easy. You feel me? This is going to be a defense that this Ravens offense is going to have to earn every single yard. Now, they got a really good offensive line. Kansas City has a pretty good defensive line, but Chris Jones is going to be there. And, and Buffalo did have success running the football, but they're going to have a way different game plan because they're going up against Lamar Jackson. So they're going to put a lot more emphasis on slowing down the run game probably than what they did last week. You know, I don't really know what they had going on last week. Maybe their game plan just was that maybe they didn't even expect Buffalo to run the football as much because Buffalo in the past hasn't really been known to run the ball as much as what they did last week with James Cook. But even then, late in the game, they still kind of played back into the Chiefs' hands when they forced them to throw the football. They probably were having the thinking that maybe they could get Josh Allen to throw a mistake because the more you ask him to throw the football, the higher chance he has is turning it over. With Lamar Jackson, 
He's a more efficient passer than Josh Allen. But when the Ravens are at their best is when they've had the ability to run the football. Now, Lamar Jackson, he's been on one as of late. All right. And no matter what game plan the Chiefs have, you know, Lamar Jackson, once he gets going like how he did last week against the Houston Texans, it's wraps. And we can and we saw what Josh Allen did last week. You know, this Chiefs defense, they came through in the fourth quarter, but for the first three, this dude, Josh Allen, was a human highlight reel. He was making every throw that you could make, and he was making all kinds of big runs. Lamar Jackson, he's more scarier than Josh Allen. And you look at how these linebackers have that injury to one of their starters, that's going to be huge. Because you need speed out there at linebacker to be able to contain somebody like Lamar Jackson. Or you're either going to have to put a safety closer to the line of scrimmage if you want to try to keep him from breaking loose outside. And then if you, even then, if you want to box him in and try to make him a passer, he's just going to dice you up because somebody's going to be open in your secondary. So whether that be Zay Flowers, maybe LeJarrius Sneed can take him out the game. But then you got OBJ. Y'all don't know about playoff OBJ. You see, they haven't really used him that much because I believe they're trying to save OBJ for games like this. And this is when a guy like OBJ could really have a standout performance. And then you got Rashad Bateman. And then Mark Andrews potentially could play in this game. Okay, so if they got Mark Andrews back, you better watch out. But... Even then, they're going up against a really well-coached defense. This is probably the best coach defense that they faced all season long, better than the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns defense doesn't play good on the road. That's why they lost to Houston. So this is a Chiefs team that you can't overlook. You really can't. And they do have Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. So no matter what, they're going to find a way to keep this thing close. And their offensive line is playing really good right now. If their offensive line continues to play that way, this is going to be a ball game, folks. I'm taking the Ravens to win. I, I can't go against that young legend out of Pompano, man. This is the year for Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is ready. He's going to be up for this game. He's, he's out to prove himself this year. And Patrick Mahomes, they got a squad, but I just... Believe that this is going to be the game where Lamar Jackson just finds a way to get it done. And the Ravens defense is good enough that you can ask them to go on the field and win the game. Try to keep Mahomes from scoring. Give me Baltimore 27-24. Lamar Jackson, he's taking those boys to the Super Bowl. You remember what he said when he got drafted? They're going to get a Super Bowl out of me. Trust, believe that. I believe it, Lamar. I believe it. But you got to show me. Patrick Mahomes, ever since he became the starter in his second season for Kansas City, has been the six straight AFC championships. And he's still equivalent to me to what LeBron James is in the NBA. You see, LeBron James, there was a stretch when he was in the finals every single year from when I was in fifth grade to like my... 11th grade or 10th grade year in high school. That's the level of dominance that Patrick Mahomes has had in the NFL. And he doesn't really lose too often in these games. He's only lost to Joe Burrow and Tom Brady. And I don't care about the Kansas City's lack of weapons on offense. You can never count out Patrick Mahomes. Hell, there were a good amount of people last week myself included, who thought that Mahomes were going to fall to the Buffalo Bills. And Patrick Mahomes showed out. He, he was damn near. If, I don't even know how to describe Patrick Mahomes anymore. But the level of play that I saw out of him last week against the Buffalo Bills was Super Saiyan God level. Okay, when you think this dude has peaked, he just gets better. He's just unlocked the new mode. It's like he's just, he knows he has to carry Kansas City. He knows that he can't make any mistake. I've never seen a dude just play so flawlessly and so effortlessly in the postseason. There are a lot of quarterbacks in the postseason, like Dak Prescott, Tua Tagovailoa, that they just tighten up. Mahomes, he's loose. He's ready for the big moment. He's ready for the final drive. 
And going up against the Baltimore Ravens, going up against Lamar Jackson, he's going up against a quarterback that has won his second MVP. And that is just as talented as him. He's just not as proven. But Mahomes, you know, if he was to retire right now, he would be in the Hall of Fame. He would. And you could probably say that Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback of the new generation, probably from like 2018 and so forth. And what makes Patrick Mahomes so special is just that anytime you count him out, that's when he plays his best. And it's really equivalent to Tom Brady. And there were years when the Patriots have won championships when they didn't have their most talented teams. And not every single season, the Patriots won the Super Bowl, even when they were the most talented. You want to know why? Because the best team doesn't always win the Super Bowl. The reason for that is because you have quarterbacks like Eli Manning, guys who are able to step up and come through when it matters the most, even when people didn't think they were the best, the most talented team on paper. And when you have a guy like Patrick Mahomes, he has the ability to completely elevate the team. And I know that sounds cliche, but there's only really a handful of quarterbacks that you can truthfully say that about. And the reason why you can really honestly say that Patrick Mahomes makes everyone around him better is because, for one, he makes the offensive line look better than what they are because he can improvise, he can make guys miss inside the pocket, he can buy time for guys to get open, and then with all the crazy-ass passes that he can throw, he can throw them from all kinds of different arm angles in between all kinds of tight spaces and small windows. There's not a throw that he can't make. And he will find the open wide receiver. He's like a damn robot. And then even when he gets into the open field, he's a little bit underrated as a runner. Hell, there are certain runs that Mahomes makes when he has no problem getting the physical and putting his pass down on you. So Patrick Mahomes, when you think about the most talented quarterback that ever played a game, I have to say it's him. And with how good he is and him having Andy Reid, probably one of the greatest offensive minds ever, if not the greatest, they have a shot to win any game that they play in. There were many people who felt like Kansas City was going to be a one and done. Maybe they lose in the divisional round and they were going to be out of the playoffs that was basically the expectations for this team they didn't play that good for the majority of this season on offense but the reason why they're in the AFC championship for a sixth straight year under Mahomes is because of him he just is one of those guys that when the pressure is on that's when he's at his best and you just can't count this man out you really can't anytime the game is on the line. If you ask Patrick Mahomes to win it for you, he comes through. And he's only lost the two quarterbacks, Joe Burrow and Tom Brady. And we know what Joe Burrow is. He's just been on the sidelines this year. But Patrick Mahomes, his greatness is the equivalent right now to what LeBron James is in the NBA. I don't say Jordan because Jordan never lost in the championship. He was undefeated in the finals. Mahomes has taken a couple of losses, but... Those losses, like the one when they got blown out by the Tempe Buccaneers in 2020, he just completely was mismatched up front. Like the offensive line they had was dealing with some injuries. They had backups in there and he didn't even have time to throw the football. But when you get this dude a somewhat halfway decent offensive line and some serviceable targets in the passing game, like Travis Kelsey's playing at his best and you got Rasheed Rice. He's able to step up. And that's what makes him elite. That's what separates from the rest that's what separates him from the rest of the quarterbacks in the NFL. There are only a handful of quarterbacks that you can call elite because elite quarterback has the ability to overcome not having a perfect situation. They can still win you a Super Bowl. You see Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes have that similar ability. But Patrick Mahomes just has it at a way higher level to me. The rest of the other quarterbacks in the league, even the good ones, 
they still need a good team around them to win. They can't win a championship with just one small limitation. They need everything to be pretty much perfect for them. But Patrick Mahomes, you get this dude, the average team, he can win you a Super Bowl. So you cannot count this man out despite the talent discrepancy that the Kansas City Chiefs are going to be walking into this Sunday in Baltimore. Because one thing about Tom Brady is that anytime it looked like he was down and out, he always found the way to do the impossible. That's the same thing with Patrick Mahomes. Let me tell you something, man. I'm one of the biggest Lamar Jackson fans in the world. And if he loses to Patrick Mahomes in the AFC Championship this year, I'm going to be so hurt. And the reason why is because he's about to win his second MVP. I really don't think that a lot of people truly understand how good Lamar Jackson is. He's one of the most dominant quarterbacks in the last couple of years that the league has seen. He does not lose that often. Every time he's healthy, the Ravens have been in contention for the one seed. Every time their season has gone left, it's been when Lamar Jackson has gotten hurt. And what a lot of people don't remember is that his rookie season, when he had to come in, when John Harbaugh was about to get fired, he led them to the playoffs, saved their season, saved John Harbaugh's job. He's the reason why John Harbaugh is still one of the longest tenured coaches in the league right now. And he's also only lost one game against the NFC. And a couple of weeks ago, I made a segment when I said Lamar Jackson was better than Patrick Mahomes. And I was really surprised at the amount of people that actually agreed with me. Like, I thought I was tripping saying that Lamar Jackson was better than Mahomes. But you see, when it comes to talent and athleticism, Lamar Jackson is better than Mahomes. And I don't really think it's close. Lamar Jackson is the most genetically gifted, it's the most talented, the most genetically, athletically gifted quarterback that we've ever seen enter the NFL. I know, I don't even know if that makes sense, but that's the only way I can word it when it comes to describing Lamar Jackson. He's truly unstoppable. He's a weapon. And we see how deadly he is as a thrower now, but you also remember what he does on the ground. It's like pick your poison when it comes to the dude. And we've never seen a quarterback have this kind of talent ever. Even Michael Vick wasn't this good because he wasn't nowhere close to the passer that Lamar Jackson is. And he has even admitted this publicly several times with no issues. You see, Lamar Jackson, there's not a single throw that he can't make. There are plays that Lamar can make that Mahomes can't make just because of his athleticism. He has a great arm, too. He can throw from different body angles, off-platform. And let me tell you about the young legend out of Pompano. He has accomplished everything there is to accomplish in the NFL but win a championship. And the only reason he hasn't been able to do that isn't because he isn't able to step up in the postseason. It's because he hasn't had a good enough team that guys like Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes have had in the past. Patrick Mahomes was winning a championship with prime Travis Kelsey and prime Tyreek Hill and a really good offensive line, plus Andy Reid. Lamar Jackson had Greg Roman with those three tight end sets and not really a uh, evenly good receiver that was close to what Zay Flowers is right now as a rookie. Maybe Marquise Brown, but that was about it. And Mark Andrews, you always had him, but you still need a good wide receiver. And now the Baltimore Ravens this year, with Lamar Jackson having Todd Munkin as his offensive coordinator, he now has what Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes have had in the past that has led them to the Super Bowl. As long as Lamar Jackson doesn't have one of those games when you know, he gets a little bit clumsy with the football. He should be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Patrick Mahomes. And he has to be able to beat Patrick Mahomes to prove to all of the haters and the critics that he is truly the best quarterback in the National Football League. People seem to think that Mahomes has this weird armor around him that he's invincible and he can't be beaten in the postseason. Even though Joe Burrow has beaten him in the past and Brady has beaten him in the past. 
And you see with Lamar Jackson, he's good enough to beat Patrick Mahomes. He has the squad. Hell, his team is better than the Kansas City Chiefs. So when it just comes to the quarterback advantage, Lamar Jackson really is gooder or just as good, if not better than what Mahomes is right now. So all he has to do is go out and show it. And if he can't get it done, then this is going to be a really huge blunder on his career because he may not ever get another opportunity to get back to the AFC championship. Regardless of how good he is, you're going to have Joe Burrow coming back fully healthy. What if Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson ever figure it out in Jacksonville? Hell, what if Deshaun Watson ever bounces back? You just never know. So you have to take advantage of this opportunity to be the down Kansas City Chiefs team. Despite how good they've been playing in the postseason, you still have a better team. And Lamar Jackson is about to win his second MVP. You can't win your second MVP award and go out the same way that you did similarly when you won it the first time in 2019. You got to be able to cap it off with a Super Bowl. And if Lamar Jackson wins a Super Bowl, do you not know what that would do for his legacy? At this point, you could say that he's the best black quarterback ever. Not trying to be racist, but just being honest. Whoever, who else could you say would be better than Lamar Jackson? He'll be the best mobile quarterback that ever played a game. Better than Michael Vick. Better than Randall Cunningham. Better than Cam Newton. Better than Russell Wilson. Better than whoever else. And then you can make the argument that he's the best quarterback in the NFL. Hell, he's already in my book the better quarterback than what Mahomes is just because he's more talented based on his athleticism. But the only thing that Lamar Jackson is lacking when it comes to the argument is that he doesn't have the championship pedigree that Mahomes has, even though I still disagree with that because championships are a team accomplishment, not a single player individual accomplishment. But Hell, if that's what Lamar needs to make his case, then that's what he needs to do. And if he wins a Super Bowl, then the national media can have no more leeway when it comes to Mahomes being better than the rest of the pack. But even if they do want to say, well, Lamar Jackson, he, he was able to do it against the down K Chiefs team, it still doesn't matter. You want to know why? Because... Patrick Mahomes has the whole label that he should be able to elevate his teammates. And everybody is already hyping up how good they've been playing in the playoffs the last couple of weeks. And even if they do beat a down Kansas City Chiefs team, you're still going to beat a really good 49ers or Detroit Lions team in the Super Bowl, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you win the Super Bowl. All that matters is that you win one. You can make a Case the bunk, the debunk, hella Super Bowls that Tom Brady won. You see, Lamar Jackson, in the hearts of most NFL fans out there that think logically, is already the best quarterback in the NFL. But for the people that base their whole arguments about who's better because of championships, then you're always going to go with Mahomes. But what you overlook is that you still got to have the team around you, the talent around you, to win those championships. And Lamar Jackson hasn't had that. And hell, he's done more with less. You give Patrick Mahomes what Lamar Jackson had to work with early in his career, I don't think he still would be as good as what he is right now. You give Lamar Jackson, Andy Reid, prior Travis Kelsey, and Tyree Kill, there's no telling. He probably could have won just as many Super Bowls as what Patrick Mahomes has right now but Kansas City is looking to 3 P, and they're looking to become a dynasty but Lamar Jackson is about to get in the way of that and like I've been telling people for the last couple of months that you need to hold on when it comes to giving Kansas City the dynasty label you see there are other quarterbacks in the league like Lamar Jackson, such as Josh Allen and Joe Burrow, who are just as good as Patrick Mahomes, they just don't get that credit because they haven't won the Super Bowl. And a lot of people base their arguments on who's best or who's better than who based on championships is not right. I don't agree with it, but that's just how it goes. 
And Lamar Jackson, to be the man, you have to beat the man. And he has to beat Patrick Mahomes. And if he loses this game, I'm going to be so upset. So upset. I remember watching him when he was a freshman at Louisville. And he's from the area that I currently reside with. So, got a root for Lamar Jackson. And he's been one of the biggest draft steals of all time. Like, Ozzie Newsome drafted him one of, in his final draft. Like, Lamar Jackson... For him to be a two-time MVP, having the opportunity to win the Super Bowl, this is going to be big for his career. So Lamar Jackson, for him to finally be able to get over the hump, he has to go through Patrick Mahomes. Six straight AFC championships, best quarterback in the game in a lot of people's opinion. For him to get to his first ever Super Bowl, he has to go through the most dominant quarterback in the league. And if he can do that, and if he can win the Super Bowl, then you can make the argument. You can make the case that Lamar Jackson is better than Mahomes. And it really shouldn't be that big of an argument. But for his legacy, he has to be able to cap this season off with the win in the Super Bowl. And it all starts with beating Mahomes. Because if he can't get it done and the Ravens just lay an egg, you don't know if they're ever going to get back to this spot. The Tennessee Titans have made a really big decision. They've hired a new head coach, that being Brian Callahan, formerly the offensive coordinator for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, you know, the reception to this hire hasn't really been great. A lot of people are like, who? You hired who? Is he better than Mike Vrabel? And this is what people got to understand about this hire. All right? This was one of those best bang for your buck hires. You ever go to Walmart? And you go to the great value section and you have the great value fruit loops and they're only a dollar fifty cents. And then you got the real fruit loops on the left side and they're like four dollars. You're gonna go with the great value because maybe you don't got enough money to get the real thing of fruit loops. So it's the best bang for your buck. You see, Tennessee wasn't gonna get any of the top head coaching candidates out there. Bill Belichick wasn't going to be interested in this job. Jim Harbaugh wasn't going to be interested in this job. Ben Johnson wasn't going to be interested in this job neither. So you were only going to be able to get one of the more mid-candidates out there. And that was Brian Callahan. And I don't say that in a bad way. It's just he's not as big as the other top candidates out there. But it's not like this dude is some slouch. And he never called plays in Cincinnati. So the play calling that you saw this past season was from Zach Taylor. Brian Callahan has worked with Matthew Stafford, Peyton Manning, and Derek Carr. He's been on some pretty good offensive staffs. Zach Taylor's offense has been really good. And it was really good with Jake Browning. And even though he doesn't call the plays, there's been other head coaches that have never called plays in the past, that's having success now, one of them being Mike McDaniel. And Brian Callahan's success is all going to hinge on what he can do with Will Levis. You see, this is why it made perfect sense. Tennessee moved on from Mike Vrabel. What was Mike Vrabel's biggest downfall? He was never able to get the offense right. Even despite the lack of talent that they had, the offense still wasn't really that good. So you move on from Mike Vrabel, and you got Will Levis, who he has signs to be a really good quarterback, but he also has signs that he could end up being not so great. And Will Levis' development should probably be the priority for Tennessee because they aren't really in position to get any of the top quarterbacks in this year's draft. And Will Levis... You know, he's the best quarterback play. Well, he gave them the best quarterback play that they've gotten in, what, like two years? Ron Tannehill has been washed up and injured. So you bring in a guy like Brian Callahan, Will Levis has all the tools to be one of the best quarterbacks in the league. You just need an offensive-minded coach who can unlock that. And if you weren't going to be able to get a guy like Ben Johnson, were you going to take a gamble on a guy like Bobby Slowick? who only has been the offensive coordinator for Houston for one season? Or are you going to get a guy like Brian Callahan, who already has been a finalist for several head coaching jobs in the past? Brian Callahan 
His success in Tennessee is all going to stem on if he can turn Will Levis into a superstar. Look at the current state of the AFC South right now. You got the Houston Texans with C.J. Stroud, who has already proven himself to be a top five quarterback. You got the Indianapolis Colts, who almost made it to the playoffs with Gardner Minshew as their quarterback. Shane Steichen already has proven that whatever quarterback he gets, he puts them in the system to win. And I am only can imagine how deadly Anthony Richardson is going to be in his offense in year two, despite him coming off that injury. And then you got Jacksonville, which Jacksonville, they if they end up figuring out next season between Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence, and Trevor Lawrence really plays up to his potential of that generational label that they threw on him when he got drafted first overall years back, they're going to be scary too. So if you're Tennessee, you need good quarterback play. You can't afford to keep dabbling with different quarterbacks. You know, Will Levis, his... Thursday night game against Miami was really good. And this debut against the Atlanta Falcons was fantastic. But outside of those two games, he was a little bit over the place. So if you can get a guy like Brian Callahan who can reel in Will Levis and turn this dude into a superstar, you can be finding yourself in the playoffs. You see, the NFL now isn't like how it used to be when you can just win with anybody at QB. You see, the quarterbacks that are in the AFC Championship, in the NFC Championship, are all really good quarterbacks. You can't win with average QBs anymore. You see, now with a guy like Brian Callahan, you're going to be able to have a head coach who can fix what your biggest deficiency was under Mike Vrabel. And offensive-minded coaches are starting to take over the league now. He's been with a lot of successful offenses really good quarterbacks in the past, this hire is getting way more hate than what it deserves because it really doesn't deserve any. They weren't going to be able to get a bigger name. For the people that are saying, oh, they could have got Jim Harbaugh, they could have got Belichick, neither of those guys were going to want to take this job. This is still a rebuild. Brian Callahan is one of those coaches that he may need a little bit of time to continue to learn on the job. So a guy like Bill Belichick, Jim Harbaugh, who may just want to win now with the already established quarterback, they weren't being enticed for a job like this. And Tennessee is one of those squads that they're not really enticing to bigger name candidates out there. Brian Callahan, to me, was always the ideal fit. When I did my head coaching predictions, I, I, will, I had Brian Callahan predicted to get this job. Will Levis is a promising quarterback that... You don't really know how good he is because you still don't have enough proven film. But you think about what he could be. And if you bring in a guy like Brian, Brian Callahan and he can get it right with Will Levis and they can worry about improving the offensive line, getting some better receivers, this could be a really good hire. But it's getting a little bit too much hate. They weren't going to be able to get any of the better head coaches out there. And that's not being disrespectful. That's just being real because this is a franchise that's in a rebuild right now. They just got rid of Mike Vrabel. But his biggest problem was that he missed on his offensive coordinator hires. After Arthur Smith, it was downhill from there. His offense was all about running that ball with Derrick Henry. You need more creativity. That's what Brian Callahan should do with you. Just because you don't call plays doesn't mean you're not going to be a good head coach. There's been plenty of head coaches that have had success that have never called plays in the past. He still has assisted with game planning, scouting, working with Joe Burrow. If he can make it work with Will Levis, this is going to be a successful hire. Now, before we move on, if you haven't already, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Remember that we're not just a YouTube channel. We are a podcast. You can find us on all podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. The Jaguars made a big time hire. One of the biggest reasons why they had that big collapse at the end of this past season was because their defense was not good. They didn't have a good pass rush and they didn't have good secondary play. 
So when they got rid of their previous defensive coordinator, they went out and replaced him with probably the best defensive coordinator on the market and Ryan Nielsen, who was the DC for Atlanta this past season. Although it was his first season, he did a tremendous job turning around the Falcons defense. And many Falcons fans were really upset that their owner didn't choose to keep this guy around because he did God's work with that defense, man. They were 7th in points per game allowed, 10th in yards per game allowed. They had a top 3 defense when it came to getting their opponents off the field in 3rd down situations. And they were top 5 in red zone defense. This is the best hire that the Jaguars could have made to fill their defensive coordinator vacancy. This is probably one of the better defensive coordinators that the Jaguars have had in a while. Many Falcons fans wanted this dude to stick around. For the Jaguars to land him, this is big. You're going to be able to get better secondary play, and you're going to have a better pass rush. This probably could be the right defensive coordinator who can help Trayvon Walker reach, reach that next level. I was starting to lose a little bit of faith in Trayvon Walker. I was ready to call him a bust, but he came around a little bit this season. A guy like Ryan Nielsen, who is really good at being able to maximize the talent that he gets at the pass rusher position or the edge position, he could be the key to unlocking the full potential of Trayvon Walker and showing why he was a first overall pick. Ryan Nielsen was a fantastic hire by the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he could be the difference between Jacksonville going deep in the playoffs next season if they're able to fix their problems offensively. Because if they can get Trevor Lawrence right, now they're going to have a defense that's going to be good enough to slow down the Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow. This is a really fantastic hire. And it's one of those hires that many of the casual fans out there, they're not really going to pay attention to because not a lot of people care about the coordinators unless you got a big name coordinator that's about to be a head coach like a Ben Johnson. But a guy like Ryan Nielsen could potentially be a head coach and waiting with how good of a defensive coordinator he is. He previously spent a few years with Dennis Allen down there in New Orleans before he took the D.C. job in Atlanta. And the defense was the only reason why that team was able to win the small amount of games that they did with Arthur Smith at the helm. And their defense bailed that offense out on several occasions. The only reason why I fought her down the stretch is because the offense just was embarrassing. But the Jaguars already had a really good run defense. Atlanta's run defense was solid, but their Pass defense was outstanding. He got great play out of his cornerbacks. Cornerback play for Jacksonville has not been good the last few years. And this has been a defense in general that has only really been able to get stops, mostly based on forcing turnovers. And turnovers aren't a consistent way to win games if that's your only bread and butter on defense. Because turnovers can vary. When you're going up against a quarterback that doesn't turn the football over, then how are you ever going to get off the field? Ryan Nielsen was a fantastic hire at defensive coordinator by the Jacksonville Jaguars. If they can fix this offense, because this defense is going to be really good. Like, his resume with Atlanta speaks for itself. Go look at how good that Falcons defense was. They get that offense right. Trevor Lawrence can play up to his potential. They definitely could be a sleepy or a sleeper Super Bowl contender next season. The Chicago Bears have a new offensive coordinator in the Windy City. Shane Waldron previously has spent three seasons as the offensive coordinator down there in Seattle. And his offenses are really explosive. This past season, he was top five in big play passing, big play rushing. So the Chicago Bears... What their passing attack has been lacking is the ability to truly throw the football downfield. And we don't know what direction they're going to go with Justin Fields. Are they going to trade him and drive Caleb Williams? Are they going to keep him and continue to build around him? But Shane Waldron is going to be a huge upgrade over Luke Getze. Luke Getze, the only thing he knew how to do was spam run plays, screen passes, and that was about it. And if they do keep Justin Fields, Shane Waldron could be the perfect coach to help progress him as a passer. 
And I'm not comparing Justin Fields to Lamar Jackson, but Lamar Jackson, it has helped his career now that he has Todd Munkin as his offensive coordinator. Shane Waldron was calling plays for not just Russell Wilson, his final season in Seattle, but Geno Smith threw 30 touchdowns. He had an MVP caliber season in 2022 or 2023, whenever it was when he won comeback player of the year. And when you look at Justin Fields, what's holding him back is that he still isn't progressing as a passer. Luke Getzey wasn't the right offensive coordinator for him. And Matt Eberflus, now that you're starting it over with a offensive coordinator that already has a proven resume and not somebody who's unproven, you got somebody who understands what they're doing. And Shane Rodgers was a hot head coaching candidate at the start of this past season, but his name started to lose a little bit of heat because Geno Smith had a down year and the offense just wasn't that great. And you can say that he kind of underused, he underutilized the talent that Seattle had, but truthfully, Geno Smith just wasn't it. But even then, there were moments when Geno Smith looked really good. Justin Fields getting Shane Rodgers as an offensive coordinator if he stays. If he doesn't get traded, could be what takes him to the next level. But if they trade Justin Fields and they start over with Caleb Williams, then Shane Rodgers working with a young quarterback, this could help propel this guy back into head coaching interviews, head coaching gigs potentially. Because Caleb Williams is probably one of the best quarterback prospects to come out in recent memory. And Shane Rodgers working with a guy like him is going to look really good on his resume. And they already have a pretty talented offense as it is. You got Cole Command, you got DJ Moore, you had another wide receiver in the draft, rather that be Roma Dumze or Malik Neighbors, or you sign one in free agency like T. Higgins. Caleb Williams, Shane Waldron was somebody who specializes in getting the most out of the passing attack. Him working with Caleb Williams. That's going to make the Chicago Bears a playoff team next year. Their defense already looked good under Matt Eberflus. The second half of this season, they had a top 10 defense. So now you have to be able to fix the offense. And with Shane Rodgers at the helm at OC with the younger quarterback, there's no reason why the Chicago Bears offense should be as bad as what it was this past season. And even when it comes to the run game, Seattle with Kenneth Walker, they're one of the best teams when it comes to breaking off big runs. Chicago, their running back play has been really good the last few years. You got Khalil Herbert. You got Roshan Johnson. You got a good stable of backs back there. And if you bring in another running back, that's going to do nothing but just make his offense look even better. He knows how to play complimentary football. But what he could possibly do with Justin Fields, building an offense that can help mold him into a better passer or rather that be with Kayla Williams or another young quarterback whoever they draft Shane Waldron he's not a hire that you can be confident is going to make you a lead offense but he's a hire that you know he's going to be able to have a functional offense this shouldn't be an offense that was as bad as what it was under Luke Getze especially in the fourth quarter Ohio State has been dropping the bag in the transfer portal. They've been opening up that wallet, spending those dollars, getting all of the best players that there are to get from the transfer portal. They got Quinshawn Juckins, who has been one of the best running backs in all of college football. You got Travion Henderson coming back. And then you got Caleb Downs, who was a freshman All-American. He led Alabama in tackles. He was the first true freshman to lead Alabama in tackles since the 50s. And then you got another Alabama transfer. You got a quarterback who was the number one ranked prospect in his past um, recruiting cycle in 2024. And he's going to be competing with Aaron Nolan. Aaron Nolan, there was a report that came out and said that he doesn't plan on transferring. So now Ryan Day, you got Will Howard coming in, and you got two really promising freshman quarterback that can sit for a year behind Will Howard, and then eventually in 2025, you're going to have those two guys slug it out, and one of those guys should end up hitting in 
should be really good for you. So you don't have to be in a situation where you got to go in the transfer portal and get a quarterback again, and you can have somebody who you can develop for the next two to three years. Will Howard, there's been a lot of discussion about how good this guy is. At Kansas State, he looked really impressive to me. And even though he was splitting time with the true freshman quarterback that they had this past year, it wasn't like the true freshman quarterback was getting significant snaps from Will Howard. He still, I would say, in my estimate, played 80% of the snaps as a starter. And his mobility, he's not an incredible athletic guy, but he reminds me of what Kyle Trask was under Dan Mullen at Florida. He was a willing runner. And if you can get him out to the edges or if you use quarterback power, he has enough mobility that he can break off a couple of big runs just with his size. He's not one of the easiest quarterbacks to bring down. And a lot of the other competition that he was going up against in the Big 12, they were a little bit undersized, that linebacker. But I definitely think that he gives you a mobility aspect of his game. But he's a way better passer than what Honda McCord was. So Ohio State... They're loading up on talent, and you wonder if, if this is going to be enough to beat that team up north. Is it going to be enough to beat Michigan? Because let's be honest, man. Like Ryan Day has a letter, has a lot of pressure on him coming into this season. He has to win. He has to produce results. And you got to beat that team in Michigan that just won the national championship. I know that doesn't have to sit well with them, especially the administration. And you're looking at Ryan Day giving up the play call into newly hired offensive coordinator Bill O'Brien. He has to get it done this season. And anything less than a playoff appearance would be extremely disappointing. This is probably, if not the most talented team, one of the three most talented teams going into next season, at least at this moment. You got Denzel Burke coming back. This defense is stacked. You keep your defensive coordinator. I mean, it doesn't get any better than what you have to work with going into this season if you're Ryan Day. There's no reason why Ohio State shouldn't be in the national championship next season. Look how deadly your backfield is now. Now you have a quarterback who you can trust to throw the football in big games. Even though Honda McCord had a couple of games like the Notre Dame, the Notre Dame game when he engineered that game-winning drive. But Will Howard is a proven quarterback. He played really well at Kansas State. He led them to a Big 12 championship. So Ohio State, they're making some really big moves. They currently have the seventh best transfer portal class according to 247 Sports. And I only expect that they're probably going to make some more big time additions in the transfer portal. But Ohio State, do you guys think that they've made enough moves to beat Michigan? Are they going to be able to win the Big Ten next year? Let me know down in the comment section down below. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed, make sure that you leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content. Rate the podcast five stars. You can find us on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from. The JT Sports Podcast is available. And we will see you guys Thursday with another episode of JT Sports Live.